I wonder how many of you managed to have a rest. Oh, I see some thumbs, that's great. Yay. I also thought I'd better follow my own advice. So I did lie down for a good 20 minutes, which was very restorative. So uh, I wonder, Catherine, if we could um, stop the recording for now and maybe start in when I give you a cue. and casual, but there we go. I feel a bit bubbly, I have to say. Oh, good, we're recording now, so I'll stop reading the messages. And uh, yeah, let's uh, leave the chat box for a while and I'll invite you back into that later. Let's see if I can get the full view here. Sometimes I press the wrong button and then stop the actual video. So maybe I won't, won't touch anything. Okay, good. Good, so this morning, we discussed how we can start to undermine some of the hindrances towards uh, deep meditation and specifically towards the practice of mudita. So the particular obstacles to generating this kind of altruistic joy and a sort of rejoicing joy in other people's success are things like jealousy, envy, I would also say resentment, maybe even a kind of miserliness, a lack of generosity in um, either appreciating somebody's qualities or a lack of generosity and being able to really celebrate with other people's success. Sometimes we can be a bit mean-spirited, you know, and feel that perhaps they didn't really deserve it. Or sometimes people's success can come around by, you know, not very skillful means. And, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say we should rejoice in that because even though they seem to be experiencing happiness and success, they are creating causes for future suffering. So we can exercise some discernment in how far we rejoice with others. But one of the best ways to rejoice for others is in their qualities, in their qualities that they're developing, in the confidence they have in the Dhamma, for example, or um, just the goodness of their lives, you know, like the lady I mentioned who's um, working on the front lines as a doctor right now. Um, isn't this a wonderful thing to do? And she's from Sri Lanka, so she could have just said, no, no, this is really not the right time to be in England. I want to go back to my life over there. But she's here on her own, away from her family, and she's going with it, you know, and she's contributing as much as she can, a lot more in many ways than, um, than I do, you know, because she's actually risking herself. For others. So um, yeah, this jealousy can really impede our um, practice of mudita and yet at the same time the practice of mudita is wonderful because every time you come in contact with an obstacle you can be sure that that's the step to developing and deepening in that quality. That obstacle was there anyway and now you're starting to see it so now there's a possibility to you know move beyond it to understand it, first of all, how it arises, but also the causes for its disappearance and to move a little bit deeper in your practice. So one thing I've noticed also is that it's not only that envy or jealousy robs me of my own happiness right now, but it also makes it hard for me to be a good friend to another because a good friend would really rejoice in your success, in your confidence, your empowerment, you know, and for example, I've also experienced it the other way that people who I don't expect to be, um, I suddenly realise that there might be some envy directed to me. And I'm always quite surprised by that because any qualities or um, strengths that I have, either I don't really recognise them or I don't consider them sort of personal and I try to share them with others. And yet sometimes I do sense that, you know, other people might have jealousy or resentment towards me. And what I've noticed with that is that um, it becomes hard to really trust them as a friend because it almost makes me feel that I've got to stay small in order to not intimidate them. You know, I have to keep myself a little bit small because otherwise they'll feel bad. And so I can't fully be confident that they want to see me flourish and blossom and bloom, right? And in the same way, that's the, you know, if we're envious of others, they can't really fully trust that we're on their side, that we're championing their success. 
So it's really wonderful if we can start to see that other people's happiness doesn't take anything away from ours. In fact, it contributes to the greater good, the greater happiness. Because when you feel joyful, you're more likely to do good, to contribute more into society and to affect each other, um, other people's lives in a positive way. And when you affect other people's lives in a positive way and show them the beauty of generosity, of kindness, then they get inspired. They feel joyful and feel inspired to do good too. So the whole thing becomes this beautiful kind of um, ripple effect, you know, expanding in ever widening concentric circles. And the goodness just keeps on moving outwards like a tsunami of joy. So it's for everybody's best benefit. So we have to look at these places that we get stuck and work on them at the level of speech and conduct and, of course, right intention. Um, but then also we can look at mudita as a way to deepen our meditation as a Brahma Vihara. And the word Vihara, I was meant to mention that earlier. I mentioned the word Brahma means like beings who live in um, states of love and joy without animosity for any being. And vihara means an abode, a place of abiding for the mind, right? A place where the heart can return to, or the mind can return to again and again and make itself a home. And so the more we're able to immerse ourselves in these states, the more they become um, natural inclinations of our mind. And our mind tends to um, move towards those beautiful charitable thoughts and actions in our everyday life yeah um, there's a lovely quote here which also talks about how when we're able to spread mudita and any of the brahma viharas far and wide we actually change the way karma manifests right so we're not only influencing the quality of our mind right now we're also um changing the quality of our minds, making it so expansive, so boundless, that any um, actions that we've done in the past that were perhaps unskillful, they will not have very strong effects. It's, um, there's another simile in the suttas called the simile of the salt. And the Buddha said it's like um, the difference between putting a big crystal of salt in a glass of water. The glass of water becomes so salty that it's, you know, undrinkable. You can't quench your thirst by drinking that glass. And you notice the salt, right, more than anything else. It's very, very strong. But if you put the salt in a big lake, yeah, you can't notice that salt at all. The water is completely uh, drinkable and can quench your thirst. And it's similar, you know, that if, uh, say, jealousy or resentment to arises in a mind that's small and contracted or already maybe tired, brittle, irritable, then it really can overpower the mind and make us more miserable. And then we react to that and the whole cycle increases. So we're making negative karma with the negative uh, karma from the past. But if it, a resentment or jealousy uh, raises its head when your mind is already very resourced and expansive, it hardly has any impression. Sometimes you feel it just bounces right off. You know, it really doesn't affect your mind. So in this way, our karma is also malleable. It's not fixed. And, uh, and we can do a lot, you know, to change the way it manifests in the present moment. So the Buddha says, and this is in the Majjhima Nikaya number 99, he says uh, that one dwells pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with uh, sympathetic joy. Just as a vigorous trumpeter could make themselves heard without difficulty in the four quarters, so too when the liberation of mind by altruistic joy is developed in this way, no limiting karma remains there, none persists there. This is the path to the company of Brahma. So again, Brahma is that abiding, that beautiful um, realm, whether internal or external, um, where there is no more uh, possibility for the seeds of negative, unskillful actions to arise. For as long as you're in that state of mind, of course. So these liberations are basically synonymous with the jhanas. 
and um, we can temporarily overcome the hindrances in those states as a stepping stone to really seeing things as they truly are and to developing wisdom into the three characteristics of impermanence, suffering and non-self. But the path is very beautiful because it always takes us through these really resourced states, first of all, and we can gradually start to develop them. So when we do this, there becomes a sort of integration between our daily life and our sitting practice. So that you know, we kind of overcome some of the coarser hindrances through our body and speech and skillful attitudes in everyday life. And when we sit on the cushion, you know, we don't have to, so much to tidy up in our mind. Right. Whereas when you've been kind of breaking sealer, speaking badly of others, you sit down to meditate and your mind's all over the place. So we can do a lot of the preparatory work on the cushion, on sorry, in the daily life. But equally, when we deepen our practice on the cushion <laughs> in these states of samadhi, then that tends to filter into everything else we do in our life. We become more patient, more equanimous to, you know, irritations or perceived slights. Um, maybe more charitable, again, in our thoughts and attitudes towards others. And also, we tend to start becoming much more confident about the causes for happiness and how to put them in place. And when we do that, it empowers us on the path so that we don't have to blame other people for things that go wrong or blame the society or blame the government quite so much. Yeah? Because there's some things we can't control in life. And, you know, no amount of effort is going to really help there. So we start to understand also from the equanimity where our intentions can be of most effect, where our actions can have most effect in, in alleviating suffering. And that will be different for all of us, right? We're not all asked to be activists. We're not all asked to be Buddhist teachers or doctors or, you know, whatever it is, parents or, yeah tour guides <laughs> many of you here have all kinds of professions <laughs> so we all contribute in the ways that make sense to us and our lives become more and more aligned with our value systems and so the buddha said you know that um this enables us to open ourselves to start opening ourselves to a different kind of joy and this is one of the beauties of mudita because joy is an important an important part of the path yeah the Buddha talks about the path as a gradual refinement of the wholesome joy, wholesome happiness. There's the kind of happiness that's based on sensuality, on the pleasures of the senses, sight, sound, smells, taste and touch. And this is a natural part of life, right? It's okay to enjoy your food. It's okay to have a hot bath. You know, most of you are not monastic, so you'll be in relationships and there's nothing sinful or wrong about any of that. But the thing is, these aren't dependable, long lasting happinesses, and they do actually create dependency quite often. And there's also the uh, danger of becoming addicted, right, to anything that distracts us from what's really going on inside. And sometimes we can use sense pleasures in that way. I mean, I do it myself sometimes. I'm feeling lonely or, or whatever, and suddenly I find that my intention to read an article on the dreaded social media has turned into an hour of scrolling. You know, <laughs> yes, it happens to nuns as well. And it's a kind of avoidance. I know that, you know, it can be a kind of, oh, there was something a bit empty inside and I was attempting to fill it by connecting in this way. But actually, after a while, you notice that it would have been time best spent connecting with myself, connecting with my heart, and even connecting with that feeling of perhaps slight disorientation, being alone for so long. So we start to gain the strength actually through living a virtuous life and inner happiness that allows us to meet ourselves more deeply, more fully and with a lot more kindness as well. And this kind of generosity that we develop towards others and towards ourselves, it feels good and it has its own kind of um, uh, reward built into it. And the Buddha called that the blameless bliss, Anavajasaka. It's blameless because it leads to non-remorse. Yeah, you can go to sleep with a happy conscience knowing that you've done your best. Or even if you haven't, at least you've abstained from harm, from intentional harm. Yeah? And you can look at yourself and say, well, you know, I made mistakes, but making mistakes is fine. At least I'm someone who can admit that to myself. 
I actually had to do that this afternoon because uh, there's been quite some discussion around one of the recent books published called um, Poems of the First Free Women. Many of you have uh, read this book or you've been to talks where some monastics have been reading these poems and uh, they're very lovely and sort of uplifting, inspiring little poems. But the fact is they're not actually translations of the Terigata, which are the poems of the enlightened elder nuns in the time of the Buddha. And the translations, <laughs> okay, they're not translations. They're very, very far removed from the actual poems of those nuns. I wouldn't even really call those enlightened nuns teachings poems. They were more like inspired utterances that came after deep realizations of the Dhamma. But anyway, what's happened is that um, a man called Matti Weingast has um, taken on this project to kind of translate these poems, only it's more of a, um, a book that's inspired by the poems than a translation. And unfortunately, I was asked to make an endorsement for this book, and I did so without really properly reading the poems. And so I used the word translation in my endorsement and said it's a lovely translation, you know. Uh, mainly because a bikini friend of mine asked me to do it, so I was very eager to serve. And, uh, and now I realise that that was quite misleading, and, and many people have been confused by this, because it's actually, in a sense, uh, because the, the interpretation of these poems is so far removed from the original, and it's in the voice of a white man, that it actually obscures the voices of these ancient Indian enlightened women. And also some of the Dhamma content is much diluted and often left out altogether. And so I made a public apology today, sort of saying, you know, that I'd written this endorsement uh, in haste. And somebody wrote to me and said, isn't it wonderful that you can do that, you know, that you can make that apology and admit your mistake, not only, you know, to friends or whatever, but publicly. And I just replied sort of off the cuff. I said, oh, yeah, no, it's easy to do that because it's about the Dhamma and, you know, not to actually boost myself up, but just to sort of say, yeah, no, no, it's easy. You know, it's easy to do that. It's no big deal. But then when I lay down after lunch, I realized that, um, yeah, I could have I could have just taken a moment and paused there and thought, huh, that is true. It's a quality to admit one's mistake, right? It is a quality. <laughs> But I'm just so quick to sort of run on to the next thing and to brush right over that. But these are all parts of sila. These are all things that we can rejoice in and reflect on. And the Buddha had these practices called chaganusati, which means literally um, reflecting on one's own generosity, on one's own goodness. And it's interesting because I was reading some research recently on gratitude, and they found out that by you know, writing down those three things every day that you're grateful for, or even writing for two minutes on a theme that you're grateful about every day, um, you actually double the amount of um, stimulation or whatever in the reward center of the brain. So you actually multiply your happiness, you double it by reflecting on it again. And isn't this interesting because the Buddha had this there in the texts all that time ago. He said that it's not enough just to do the sealer, or at least you can infer that it's not enough just to do those wholesome acts, but you need to bring it up in your mind afterwards and reflect on it again and again. Not only on your own goodness, but on the goodness of others and on your blessings in life. You know, So there was one story in the ancient text about Kimbila, Anuruddha and Nandiya, these three great monks, which could have been three great nuns, but anyway, in this case, it's monks. We have a lot more of their legacy preserved, it seems. <laughs> and it doesn't matter, yeah, gender's not the thing here, but, um, but it's an inspiration to all of us. And they got very deep meditation after, you know, after some struggle, like all of us have. Um, and the Buddha asked them how they did this and how they lived together, you know, how they practiced, basically, as a community. And they said that they frequently reflect and consider what a great gain it is for me. What a great gain to live with such noble companions in the holy life. Basically, that's a kind of mudita, isn't it? What a great gain it is for me to live with these wonderful companions. You're rejoicing in your own happiness and fortune and you're also rejoicing in the fact that your companions are so wonderful, so virtuous and so wise. 
And so they'd live doing these little favors for each other. They wouldn't go to meditate until everybody's needs were um, satisfied, whether it was sewing a robe or um, repairing a water jug or something, or the, I don't know, taking the water into the toilets. They'd all do these things together and then only they'd go and meditate. And they said to the Buddha, uh, we are three in body, but one in mind. And don't take that as a metaphorical one in mind, <laughs> because each person's process is an independent process. A lot of talk these days in Buddhism is about that everything is interdependent. And that is very true to a great extent in the sense that we all affect and influence each other. And in a way, you can say our own humanity depends upon seeing the humanity in another. This is very true. But our own suffering is an internal matter. Right? And we are um, a process of all the things that we've thought and done in the past. So our own particular process is independent. Independent origination is talking about the individual's process from ignorance all the way through to craving and to the next rebirth and also how that process can be stopped. So we have this basis of sila. This is always very, very important. And uh, yeah, I just made a note here about Ajahn Brand's philosophy of life, which is a really nice guide to, to our way of life. He says, um, have fun with what you're doing. Put joy into your life that gives you energy. And then don't ask for much in life. So whatever you get is a bonus. <laughs> And this is also very much a part of the sila, a part of virtue, because not asking for much in life is developing an attitude of simplicity and contentment. And this is one aspect of sila, of virtue, yeah, being contented and easily satisfied. Yeah. In the suttas, it says, you know, that one travels without burdens, if you're a monastic, just with robes and bowl, like a, like a bird has only their wings as a burden. We just go from place to place with very, very little, just, just what we need. So we can simplify and find contentment with little. And as such, of course, we develop much more happiness with whatever we do receive. So what happens after we develop sila? Well, there's a natural process that happens that can take us all the way into these deep states of meditation. And this is one of the very beautiful, almost hidden teachings of the Buddha, there's a sutta called the Upanissa Sutta and another sutta called Volition. I think it's Anguttara 10.2, I think, 10.1 or 2. And in both these suttas, it talks about how from having sila, virtue, as a basis, there's a natural process that happens. And the Buddha says, for one who is virtuous, there's no need to wish may joy arise. It's natural for one with a virtuous mind that joy arises. And the joy that he talks about here is called pamoja. Again, very similar to the word mudita, pamo, and mudita is the same root, modati. Um, so pamoja is um, a kind of joy from living a beautiful life and also developing some confidence in the Buddha's teachings, knowing that yes, there is suffering, but there's also a way out. And I have some capacity to be able to put those causes in place for my own freedom from suffering and also benefit others in the process. Yeah, and there's different ways we can generate this promoja if it's not coming up naturally. We can help ourselves, for example, by reflecting on our goodness or by reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. This is one of my favorite things to do. It's quite easy for me to reflect on the qualities of the Sangha. And I, by that, I mean the monastic Sangha and the noble beings that I've met and been so fortunate to know. You know, my own teacher, Ajahn Brown, is a great source of inspiration to me. And in all 11 years of being, you know, closely under his guidance and I mean, I, there's nothing I won't tell him, you know, we're very close and I have absolute trust that he only wishes for my well-being and there's no vested interest whatsoever on his part, even though I'm doing this project, which is very much um, an act of service and gratitude to him, you know, to develop a monastery in England, which is his native place. Still, I said to him recently, actually, just in the last uh, phone call we had on Thursday, I said, what would happen if I couldn't fulfill this? Because sometimes I do wonder whether the conditions are ripe. I feel like I'd be laying you down. 
And he used a little bit of a rude word, which he uses in Pali, so that he doesn't have to swear. He basically said, that's go, Mayam. <laughs> Some of you know what that means. It means what comes out of a cow. <laughs> but basically, he said that thinking, <laughs> I'm glad you're, you're laughing and not <laughs> recoiling in horror. But <laughs> yeah, he basically said that thinking that I owe him anything or that I'll be letting him down is rubbish is rubbish you know that's not the case because there's nothing wasted right by doing your best and all he wants from me is my happiness of course it'd be great if there can be a bikini monastery here and we both want that um but basically what he was saying is you always have my support and he knows me he knows my weaknesses as well as sees possibly some of the strengths that are yet to come to fulfillment and yet there's no fixing no judging no measuring at all you know, sometimes I've tried to say to him, do you think I'm progressing? Like, it doesn't seem like it, Ajahn, you know, because <laughs> I'm so busy, I'm not so sure. And don't you think I used to be happier? And, you know, once he just looked at me and he said, I really don't judge. I really don't judge. Like, And I thought, mm, that wouldn't be judging, would it? And that'd just be telling me <laughs> what you think. But he actually can't answer that question because what he means by not judging is he just doesn't have a fixed image in that way. For him, it's beyond a person. It's about putting causes into place. And those causes, he is very confident, will have wholesome effects. So sometimes I say to him, maybe I won't get enlightened in this life because I'm so busy, I don't have enough time to practice. And he just says, I can't see how it won't happen <laughs> because, because the causes are there, right? So he can't see how it won't happen. And that's the confidence of somebody who knows the Dhamma. You know, I can't claim to have the same confidence right just yet, but it's so beautiful to see people like this, you know, and to share in their happiness and their freedom and joy because people who develop themselves like this share, you know, nothing but the Brahma Viharas are generated by them. So there's no holding back, you know, we don't lose out. I never look at my teacher and think, damn, you know, I wish I was like that. I mean, yeah, sure, I, I wish I can aspire to that, but there's not a jealousy, right? Because somebody else having developed these beautiful qualities can only be a benefit to the world. And also when you're teaching, like even in my role, if I was gonna start getting jealous because some of you are getting deep meditation the first time you sit, you know, then I wouldn't be much of a good teacher <laughs> because my intention should be that you do become free, right? That you do develop happiness and joy within yourself. And I know that anything you develop will be coming back to me <laughs> if I've had at all a little tiny helping hand in that. So the Buddha talks then about how this joy naturally leads to PT, what is called sometimes rapture, yeah? So one who has joy in the mind, when they sit to meditate, rapture arises. So you could call this a kind of rapturous joy. And uh, sometimes it's called bliss or delight, um, but it's a certain stage in the practice, especially if you're practicing with the breath. It's discussed in the Majjhima Nikaya 118 on the Anapana Sati Sutta. And um, the first stages of the breath meditation are just to notice the breath coming in, going out, and whether it's a long or a short breath. But then the next stages are to start to experience joy with the breath, experience the piti with the breath. So a certain rapture starts to come in because your mind has simplified a lot and let go of so much just to be able to stay with the breath. And it's starting to get interested in the breath, starting to become one with the breath. And, um, and it's a, a different kind of happiness that starts to well up from inside. And at this time, it's easy to stay with the breath because the breath is something pleasant. It's no longer a struggle or a strain. Of course, the PT can arise and pass away and there are different ways we can experience it. Sometimes it sort of suffuses the whole body. Sometimes it's like a sudden sort of almost like electric shock, or it can be like sort of showery sensations coming through. Sometimes I get it sort of through one side of my head. It feels like one side of my brain sort of goes into like bobbly bliss. Very strange. It doesn't really matter what it is. It could be something very quiet also, just like a gentle shift from something more maybe sensual or exciting outside to just a slight sense of inner peace. 
And the more we can notice this and incline our mind towards it, open our mind up and become receptive to it, um, the more it can develop. And the interesting thing is at this point, you notice that the more you interfere, the more it tends to recede. So this starts to make sense of why the Buddha says it's a natural process and one doesn't need to wish may PT arise. It's almost as though by wishing it arises, you actually interrupt it because the sense of self comes back in. The sense of craving, you know, oh, this isn't good enough, what's next? I want a bit more. You know, she talked about rapture. I can't describe this as rapture. This isn't enough. <laughs> There's a very funny little um, cartoon I found. I'll see if you can actually see it, but I'll read it as well. But it's it's really it made me laugh because this is what many of us do now. Uh, will you be able to see that or shall I also read it out? So I'll also read it. It says, here I am, happy and content. But then he has this thought but not euphoric. So now I'm no longer content. I'm unhappy and my day is ruined. I need to stop thinking while I'm ahead. <laughs> That's great, isn't it? So he's sitting there feeling like, oh, I'm just happy and content. And then, you know, sometimes you get this comparative thought, but I'm not euphoric. Someone else talked about bliss. Someone else talked about jhanas. Ah, oh, now all the contentment disappears because as soon as that wanting comes in, that sense of lack or not enough, you lose everything you have. You know, you're literally sacrificing what you have for what could have been, might have been, should have been, according to the ego, the sense of self. So we do this throughout our life. And, you know, I've done this in meditation. I've been meditating and feeling all this rapture and bliss arising. And then it's like, oh, Oh, I wonder what's coming next. You know? <laughs> and then I've gone to my teacher and told him, and he said, I thought he'd sort of say, Oh, you ruined the whole process. But he just said, No, you know, this will happen. This will keep happening until you get used to the bliss, until you learn to really open and relax with it and, and just increasingly gently let go. So we gain confidence. And after a while, when we are able to open and we become saturated, the PT will turn into what we call pasadi, which is like tranquility. It's a quietening of that joy. You could call it quiet joy or tranquility. And it's almost, I feel as though it's like you've had your fill of the very stimulating, uplifting, energizing joy. And naturally the mind just wants to settle a little bit more deeply. It just wants to calm down that little bit more. And at this point, the body and the mind can stay with the object for a long time. The body is very still. You don't need to move. And the Buddha likens it to being um, in the shade of a tree, yeah? to being on this long journey through the desert and you're looking for refreshment and suddenly you find the shade of a tree and you're just able to sit under that and enjoy the shade. So it's very cooling and calming and relaxing kind of joy. And from there, the Buddha says, one does not need to make the intention, may sukha arise. Sukha is sometimes translated as happiness. I also like the, the translation of deep contentment, deeply contented kind of joy, because it's natural for one with tranquility that this sukha, this deep contentment will arise. And the Buddha likens um, the experience of sukha or contentment to finding a cool lake in that same desert. Yeah, so the tranquility is sitting under the shade of the tree. The sukkah is like finding a cool lake. And I think, you know, this also symbolizes the um, refreshment that you feel, the quenching of thirst, the quenching of craving, and the depth, perhaps, of that joy. Yeah, profoundly, profoundly satisfying and restorative. And so we can really start to let go into that. And this is actually the proximate cause for the jhana experiences, for the deep states of samadhi. It's this deeply contented joy. So that really shows you that the word concentration for samadhi cannot really be right. Yeah. Ajahn Brahm calls samadhi stillness. And I think that's much more beautiful because we've seen through this process that things are starting to calm. You know, if you're deeply, deeply contented, you don't need to make any effort anymore. The effort stopped a long time ago. The breath is in the mind. And at this point with the sukkha, 
the breath is almost in the background and it's the actual contentment and joy that takes over the mind. It's becoming one pointed. It's like the breath has become joy. Yeah, the mind has become joy. So everything it observes is joy, is peace. Yeah. So at this point, it's the proximate cause for the samadhi, which I would call the still empowered joy, if we're having to look at it through the eyes of joy. It's like the still, very deeply still and highly empowered in the sense that it's the mindfulness is so strong and so precise. So at this point, we've really turned inward. Yeah, we've stopped moving on or out to any object on the outside and our mind and its object has become one. And this is what the Buddha means when he says that we should know how to define pleasure. This is from the Majjhima 139. He says, we should know how to define pleasure and knowing that, pursue the pleasure within oneself. So there is such a thing as pleasure that's wholesome and the direction to find that pleasure is within, it's within ourselves. So this is the kind of pleasure the Buddha is referring to. And in that sutta, he actually defines the right kind of happiness as the happiness of those four jhanas. I'll just read out part of that sutta because it's very beautiful. So one should know how to define pleasure and knowing that should pursue the pleasure within oneself. And with reference to what was this said, now here he's talking to the bhikkhus, which are the male monastics, but that term did include the nuns as well. Unfortunately, we can't be 100% sure if and how many nuns were present. And because we are teaching to a big community here, I'm just gonna call it community instead. Community, there are these five chords or types, if you want, of sensual pleasure. What five? Forms cognizable by the eye, Sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. There are these five chords of sensual pleasure. Now, the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are called sensual pleasure. So this bit sounds a little bit harsh. A filthy pleasure, a coarse pleasure, an ennoble pleasure. I say that this kind of pleasure should not be pursued, should not be developed and should not be cultivated and that it should be feared. So just to note on that, first of all, is that to notice that he's not saying this is wrong and this is bad, but he's saying it shouldn't be pursued and cultivated, right? So it's not that we can't have this experience, but we shouldn't like actually go after it and make much of it and, you know, base all our happiness on those things, mainly because they are so unreliable and impermanent. And also, of course, if we take them to extremes, it can cause a breakage of our virtue. And the reason he's calling them filthy, coarse, etc., is in comparison to the pleasures of the mind, okay? So it's to point out, to make a point that in comparison to these very refined and subtle pleasures, these things appear kind of like something you want to discard. It's like if you're a child, you know, at first you like playing in the mud or you like playing with kind of, I don't know, your jam sandwich and you get jam everywhere and you think it's fun. And <laughs> But later on, you know, as an adult, you'd think, oh, how messy, you know, what a mess. <laughs> it's not something you want to play around with, right? It's sticky, it's messy, it <laughs> creates a lot of tidying up. So in the same way, we're sort of weaning ourselves off lesser pleasures and moving on to the more refined and the more reliable and uh, truly enriching for the heart, right? Truly enriching because they come from this sense of goodness and virtue within ourselves. So then the Buddha says, the kind of pleasure to pursue. Here, community, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states of mind, one enters and abides in the first and the second and the third and fourth jhana. So these are the deep states of absorption. And these states are called the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, 
the bliss of peace and the bliss of enlightenment. That's Nekama Sukha, the word Sukha is here. Uh, Paviveka Sukha, Upasama Sukha, the bliss of peace, and Sambodhi Sukha, the bliss of enlightenment. I say of this kind of pleasure that it should be pursued, it should be developed, and it should be cultivated, and that it, not, it should not be feared, right? So sometimes we think, oh, we shouldn't be feeling too much happiness in our meditation because religion's like serious business. We should suffer for our sins. <laughs> I hope no one here thinks that. But, you know, in a subtler way, we can have obstacles coming up like, oh, have I really deserved this? Oh, I think that's enough now. I have that one. Oh, I think that's enough now. <laughs> I'll go make a cup of tea. <laughs> Get back down to basics. <laughs> Get me cuppa. <laughs> I'm making fun of my own accent, by the way. Yeah. So <laughs> sometimes we don't have quite enough of a sense of value and self-worth to really allow ourselves to delight and to realize that these things shouldn't be feared. Even the Buddha himself was kind of rather perturbed at first when he, you know, experienced these kind of pleasures. And it was only in retrospect when he remembered his experience as a child, experiencing by chance one of these deep states, that he remembered, oh, this kind of pleasure is entirely different from sensual pleasure and it should not be feared, right? Because in ancient India in those times, people used to say that, you know, uh, aestheticism was praised. You should torture and, and stress and harass the body. And that was the only way to get enlightened. So when the Buddha started eating his milk rice before he sat under the Bodhi tree, he was heavily criticized by some of those aesthetics um, who thought he'd lost the path. But in this sutta, it's actually saying that looking in a different direction for pleasure is practicing the middle way. So the middle way is actually not in between uh, sensual pleasure and self-mortification, but it's in a different direction. And that direction is within. So as I said, sometimes these obstacles that can come up are things like, you know, feeling we don't deserve it or feeling like a little bit afraid or sometimes what can happen at this point is that we get elation arising. And that's another interesting one, which relates to mudita, because one of the near enemies of mudita is actually excitement and elation. Yeah, it looks like joy, but it's actually, um, it's more self-oriented. It's more agitating than real sort of selfless joy that comes from letting go. So it shouldn't be mistaken for elation or for excitement because that does involve the sense of self. And that's when, you know, you're getting deep in meditation. You think, ooh, I like this. <laughs> more of this, please, ooh. <laughs> you know, and you get elated and that's immediately the sense of self coming in saying, I want it, you know, I want more. So again, we want to be involved. We want it to happen to us. Frequently people say, what's the point of enlightenment if you're not there to enjoy it? Because we just don't understand joy without a sense of self. <laughs> it's just impossible as long as there's a sense of self to imagine how that can be worth very much. But those who have that kind of joy, I mean, one thing is they don't claim it as a personal attainment, right? And it, and it I mean, it's more joyful for that. You know, and it's so freely given. It's not that even my teacher is always in a state of bliss. Sometimes he might be a bit tired and the body might be aching, but it's all the same. It's all the same to him. You know, he can sit down and meditate and just make peace with that. So there can be joy in the mind no matter what the external situation. So all these things need to be overcome and they're gradually overcome as we practice more and more. And of course, by practicing to overcome those coarser defilements in our daily life, we have less of a problem when we sit down to meditate. We've already addressed some of those coarser uh, potential interruptions to the process. And just lastly, because I, uh, I do want to I notice how quickly the time moves on. Um, these practices are not only practices of samadhi. They're also wisdom practices in the sense that we start to see how we create, fabricate and shape our experience depending on the quality of our mind. So once we uh, have experienced any degree of happiness or peace in our practice, we might notice that the world looks different. 
you know, we see more joy, we see more beauty. We even may, might enjoy the snow or the freezing cold weather, maybe even the rain or that piece of garbage, right? That looks like a rose. <laughs> so we start to see that perception is conditioned. It's not reliable. And yet we do have the possibility to condition it in a wholesome way once we become wise to the causes. And that by doing that, we benefit ourselves and everyone else around us too. And later on, we actually start to see, uh, there's another little sort of last one for now, but I do love to go straight to the Buddha's words, um, to say that after we spread mudita in all the directions, once the obstacles are overcome, um, we can then reflect that even those states of jhana, even those states of joy, of divine abidings, you know, universal, unconditional love, even those states are fabricated, they're volitionally produced. So here the Buddha says, one dwells pervading one quarter, the second, third and fourth, below, across and everywhere, pervading the entire world with a mind imbued with sympathetic joy, vast, exalted, measureless, without enmity and without ill will. Then one understands it thus, this liberation of mind by mudita, by sympathetic joy, is constructed and produced by volition. In other words, there was some inclination of the mind that led to that, right? It is a conditioned state. But whatever is constructed and produced by volition is impermanent and subject to cessation. If one is firm in this, they attain destruction of the influxes. That's the asawas. Um, basically, the wish to become or not become or any kind of sensuality. But if one does not attain that, which is basically full liberation, um, if one does not attain that, they become... Uh, so this is the second stage of enlightenment. So they become an anagami. And from there, they go into final nibbana without ever returning from that world. So basically what he's saying is that these states of loving kindness, of mudita, can be the cause for wisdom to arise because we can see that even these states are produced from conditions and ultimately um, pass away, right? So everything is subject to cessation. And that's why I said earlier in the messages there, somebody said everything's uh, permanent except impermanence. And I said that even impermanence is impermanent. <laughs> that's what I meant, because even impermanence can cease, right? That's the whole point really, because it's this conditioned world that is subject to the laws of suffering, impermanence and non-self. And when we actually uh, see things cease, there's an end to all of that. So that's quite deep and quite beyond what I've experienced and probably most of us. If any of you have experienced that, you can do the next session okay, because <laughs> you're already enlightened. But this is a gradual path and I think it's a very positive message in that we can always find something to reflect on and, and be joyful about, right? And it starts within our own heart, in our way of conduct, our virtue, our goodness that we can bring to the world. So don't chalk up all the mistakes you make. That's also a quality. You're willing to make mistakes and you can admit them afterwards. Instead, just, you know, reflect on your goodness and that of others around you as well, because there is so much good in the world. I'm just blessed to be in a group like this today, 91 people all practicing together. It's fantastic. So... That was a bit longer than I expected, but we will still do some meditation. <laughs> and, uh, and yes, and nothing, right? We're in the present moment with our meditation. What happens next happens next. <laughs> so please uh, have a little stretch. You will get a tea break this afternoon as well, so don't worry. There will be a tea break. This is cold tea. <laughs> Thank you. 
how would people feel if I did something a little bit um, different this afternoon? Like, I'd like to start the meditation with um, imagining that it's our last meditation. Could be the last meditation of our life. Is that scary? Shelley's <laughs> <Shirley's> face. <laughs> It's a way to bring up some joy, to help us reflect on the beauty and the value of this moment. It's not actually a death reflection. I'm not gonna take you through, like imagine you're dying or any of that. Okay. This is actually inspired by one of my non-friends in Perth. So we'll do this. Yes, this will be guided cursory, so you can record this. So make yourself comfortable as though this were indeed your last sit. How would you want to be? You want to really put your body in the most easeful position you possibly can. And as with everything, this is just an invitation, okay? So, if this doesn't work for you, please carry on as you wish. So closing your eyes gently. seems to have their okay. so closing your eyes relaxing Just imagining for a moment that this could be your last meditation. You will die one day. And we don't know when that may be. But this is not a scary thought at all. Because you know that you've lived a beautiful life. And knowing that you could die at any time puts so many things into perspective. None of your worries about the future matter anymore. There's no way you need to get to. Nothing you need to become. Any mistakes you've made in the past, any regrets, 
Now it's time to lay them all aside. They don't serve you anymore. And instead, see if you can connect to the essence, the general inclination of your life. What values did you really hold dear and true? Perhaps you can think of ways that you've influenced other people's lives in a positive direction. You've been a good brother, daughter, father, or friend. You've tried to love as well as you could. Perhaps you've done something you feel particularly pleased about. See if you can rest in a sense of appreciation and dwell in the goodness of your life. Knowing that this goodness, this inner beauty is what you can rely on. This is the shadow that will never depart. Allowing a sense of contentment to grow and develop in the heart. Nothing more to be done. Nothing more to worry about. Time to simply move deep within. To a place where time and all wanting stops.
And as you simplify, move within. And the mind quietens, you might notice the breath comes to mind. If it comes in, see if you can meet it with a sense of reverence, gentleness, joy. Treating every breath as though it could be your last. Not clinging to it, but just allowing it to rise and pass away. And every breath takes you deeper and deeper within, into this moment. And as you let go more and more, you start to realize you have more to share. You remember people in your life, people you were close to or that you only knew through casual acquaintance maybe even just pass by in the street. And a sense of gratitude arises. A sense of wanting to share the blessings of your life. Just allowing any joy, peace, contentment to start spreading outwards. As though dedicating the beauty of your life to all beings everywhere. in all the four directions, above, below, and all around. If it helps, you might imagine like a, a light, warm yellow light of the sun radiating outwards from your chest. Or 
perhaps that joy shining out with every breath. Breathing in the blessings of your life. Breathing out, wishing happiness and joy for all beings, however it works for you. Or just allowing any sensations of pleasure to ripple outwards as though your body was expanding and the energy was moving beyond your physical form. Just allow it to happen naturally. And as you're spreading this joy, allowing it to emanate out, you realize that you're also connected to all the joy in the universe. As so though giving and receiving were one and the same.
hands very gently coming back into contact with your breath, with a sense of your body, feeling the skin, the outline of your body, and noticing how your body feels now. If there are any pleasant sensations, see if you can spread them throughout the body. By simply staying connected with any pleasant feelings while sensing other parts. Just tuning in to the subtlest sense of pleasure, contentment or peace. Recognizing that you're still alive and have the precious gift of life to continue deepening strengthening beautiful qualities in your heart. So that you have more and more to share. So just gently thanking yourself for your practice. If you wish, you can continue or otherwise we'll gently move into a short period of walking meditation. So staying connected with your body as you open your eyes, maintaining the continuity. Recognizing the joy of having possibility to walk. So for those who do wish to do some walking, we'll meet back here in 15 minutes at three o'clock.